Chapter 9 Dating Revelation before AD 70 Below is an extensive list of biblical interpreters who dated the book of Revelation before AD 70 in their writings. The early date has obviously had its share of scholarly support. Kenneth L. Gentry, Philip Schaefe, F. W. Farr, John A. T. Robinson, E. P. Gold, Milton S. Terry, and others. In their books listed in the biography, mentions more than a hundred different theologians during the past four centuries who took the pre-70 date for revelation. Of these, Gentry was the most helpful. Several of these theologians also believed in the pre-70 fulfilment of most of all of Revelation, and these are not just obscure and unknown persons. Most of these are in the who's who of biblical scholarship. The ones bold-faced below are specially recommended for further study. Many of their books for which we are able to find information are listed in the biography. Some of them may still be in print or else available in digital form online somewhere. There's so many, I'll just list a few. John Lightfoot, 1658. Frank Abitzit, 1731. E.J. Harwood, 1780. Moses Stewart, 1845. J.B. Lightfoot, 1867. James Stewart Russell, 1878. Robert Young, 1822 to 1888, and so on. It goes on. And more up to date. Arthur M. Ogden, 1985. Albert P. Pigeon, 1994. Robert Charles Sproul, 1988. Ian D. Harding, 2005. Michael Allen Nichols, 2010, and so on and an ever-growing number and many others. It seems that around the beginning of the 20th century, AD 2001, writers and writings about the Pre-Trist view began to increase dramatically and it shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon. Chapter 9 Daniel and Revelation Daniel was promised that there would be a further revelation about these things given in the time of the end, not end of time. Big difference. When his people would be completely shattered. Daniel 12, 4 to 9. The only complete shattering of the Jewish people since Daniel's day to occur was AD 70 destruction. Therefore, the end time spoken of in Daniel 12 must have been AD 70 generation. The phrase used by Daniel is time of the end, not the end of time. There is a difference. The Bible nowhere teaches a return of Christ at the end of time. The futurists have done much to confuse the situation. Jesus and the apostles refer to Daniel's prophecies and apply them to the first century and AD 70. Daniel's end time was the complete end that would occur when the Jews were completely shattered. Daniel 9 26 to 27, 10, 14, 11, 27, 35 to 40, 12, 4, 6, 7, 9 and 13. It was that same end time when the abomination of desolation would be revealed and destroyed. Daniel was told to seal up his book because the end time was still a long way off. Daniel 12, 4 to 9. However, John was told not to seal up his book, Revelation, because the time of its fulfilment was at hand. Revelation 22.10 Most people agree that Revelation is dealing with the same things as Daniel. So that Revelation has to be that further revelation about the complete shattering of the Jews which was revealed to Daniel. This means that the generation when Revelation was written had to be the end time. And if we compare the descriptions Daniel 10, 5, 6, Revelations 1, 13 to 15, of the angel who gave Daniel and John these revelations, we'll see incredible similarities suggesting again that the book of Revelation is indeed 
the continuation of the revelation which was promised to be given at the time of the end. Daniel deals with the end time of the Jews when they would be completely shattered. Daniel 12. So, if Revelation deals with the same things as Daniel, then it must be dealing with AD 70 also. And if Revelation is dealing with AD 70, it had to be written before AD 70 in order to predict it. While predicting the devastating times that would come upon the Jews in AD 70, Jesus said, these are the days of vengeance, in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Luke 21 verse 22. He indicates that all Old Testament scripture would be fulfilled by the time Jerusalem was destroyed. That means Daniel, Old Testament scripture, had to be fulfilled by AD 70. Chapter 11, Matthew 24 and the Second Coming. Matthew 24 and its parallels, Mark 13, Luke 17 and Luke 21 supply powerful evidence for the idea that Jesus returned in AD 70, beginning with Matthew 23, 29 and reading straight through to the end of the chapter 24. One cannot help but notice the imminency of the events described here. In Matthew 23, 36, Jesus says, all these things shall come upon this generation. He further states in Matthew 24, 33, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Notice that he says all these things, not just some of them. And one of the things mentioned in the context is the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 3, 27, 30, 37, 39, 42, 44, 46 and 50. Either Jesus returned within a generation, within about 40 years, see Hebrews 3, 10 to 17, or he and the New Testament writers were grossly mistaken and uninspired. Some try to evade this dilemma by dividing Matthew 24 into two sections. The first dealing with AD 70 verses 1 to 34, and the second dealing with a further end of the world verse 35 and following. The following chart, the Olivet Discourse cannot be divided, shows why that approach cannot be right. Chapter 12 about the chart. See the chart on the opposite page. Some hold the idea shown on the left side of the chart. They think Matthew 24 speaks of two different time periods. One, section A, events associated with AD 70 and two, section B, events still future to us. They apply the events mentioned in Matthew 24, 1 to 34, section A, to the first time period AD 70 and the events in Matthew 24, 35, section B, to our future. However, Luke's statement in chapter 17 on the right side of the chart shows that this idea cannot be correct. Luke 17 discusses the same events as Matthew 24, but without any hint whatsoever that two different time periods were ever considered. Luke clearly sees all of these events as happening at the same time period, the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Luke 17, 30. Chapter 13. The Olivet Discourse cannot be divided. Notice in the chart how Luke records the same events as Matthew, but in a different order. Matthew's order is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but Luke's order is scrambled, 2, 4, 1, 5, 3. Luke has an event from section A, followed by one from section B, then another from section A, followed by section B. And finally, one from section A. This presents a problem. If Matthew 24 really has two sections, or two different time periods under consideration, then Luke's account is incorrect because he mixes the five events up as if they are all to happen in one time period. Either Luke is mistaken and therefore uninspired, or it is wrong to divide Matthew 24 into two sections. Of course, the solution to this is that both Matthew 
and Luke speak of the same events, which would all happen in the same time period. And Matthew 24, 34 tells us when the time period was, the generation that was alive when he spake those words, AD 30 to 70. The same coming of the Son of Man is under consideration in both so-called sections, Matthew 24, 3, 27, 30, 37, 39, 42, 44, 46, 50. So, the Greek words for coming, the chapter cannot be divided into multiple different comings. All the events in both sections are inseparably connected with the same coming of the Son of Man. The second section contains the same kind of coming, passages as the first section, using the same Greek words, parousia and erkomia, for coming. The Greek word parousia is used four times, twice in each of the two sections. We have listed them below for easy comparison. Look at the biblical text to see if there is any indication that Jesus was talking about two totally different comings of the Son of Man, separated by thousands of years. 1. First section, Matthew 24, 4-34, to 34, AD 70 coming. Parousia, Matthew 24, 3, 27. Erkamoniai, Matthew 24, 30. 2. Second section, Matthew 24, 35, alleged future coming. Parousia, Matthew 24, 37-39. Erkamoniai, Matthew 24, 42, 44, 46, 50. Some interpreters, e.g. Maximilius, Ken Gentry, Kirk, apply all these three coming passages to the first section in AD 70 and say the coming passages in the second section apply to a future glorious second advent. Such arbitrary distinctions between the two sections using the same Greek words has given critics Bertram Russell, Albert Schweitzer and others license to charge Jesus with making a mistake. Dividing the chapter means Jesus was speaking about two totally different parousias separated by thousands of years. Compare Matthew 24, 27, verse 24, 37, 39, using not just similar language, but exactly the same language, coming of the Son of Man. The word parousia, coming, is used in both sections, and the events mentioned in each section are connected inseparably with the parousia of the Son of Man. Either we have to say it is all future and make Jesus a liar, or saying any of it will occur in that generation, or make it all fulfilled by AD 70. Preterists are the only ones who are consistent on this. Jesus never distinguishes between two different comings of the Son of Man, accompanied by angels in glory and with the clouds. We would have to find such a clarification elsewhere in Jesus' teaching, since it is not found in Matthew 24 context. Note also that the Greek word parousia is not used by Jesus anywhere else in the four Gospels. It is only used here in Matthew 24, and it is used interchangeably with the other word translated coming, ekonomai. Both parousia and ekonomai are used interchangeably in this context in reference to the same coming of the Son of Man. So, there is no place in Jesus' teaching where he distinguishes between two different parousias, separated by thousands of years. It is very clear that the first century saints did not understand two different parousias here. They only knew of one return of Christ. Nor were two different parousias separated by a long delay taught by any of the New Testament writers. N.J.D. Kelly, Jericho Slave and Kellarkin and Kurt and Alan T.F. Torrance and many other careful students of church history have pointed out here the pre-70 church was pervaded with a sense of imminency about the single parousia was the very fabric throughout which the New Testament was interwoven that there was only one parousia and that it would occur in that generation creates an insurmountable dilemma for futurists 
and leaves them hopelessly vulnerable to the liberals and the skeptics who assert that Jesus indeed promised his one and only parousia within his own contemporary generation, but fail to keep the promise. Since futurists do not believe it occurred then, it forces them to see Jesus as a false prophet. The preterist view offers not just a better hypothesis, but the only solution to the dilemma. While considering Matthew 24, we should note that in Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world, and then the end shall come. This was one of those events in the first section, Matthew 24, which must have been fulfilled by 70 AD. Is there any New Testament proof that this was? Yes, see Romans 1, 8, 10, 18, 16, 26, Colossians 1, 6 and 23. Some of these passages use the very same Greek word and phrase that Matthew 24, 14 does, the end. Matthew 24, 14 must have occurred. We must note how the three chapters, Matthew 23, 24, 25, are contextually linked. That is not a collection of sayings about totally different events. These discourses were spoken on the same day and deal with the same subject Jesus had introduced in Matthew 23, the coming of the Son of Man, with its attendant woes and desolations upon Jerusalem. This becomes evident when the statements in section 2 of Matthew 24 are closely analysed. See our chart. Notice Matthew 24, 40 and 41, i.e. one will be taken and one will be left. There is a parallel in Luke 17. Lest anyone think this is the rapture, we only need to look at Luke 17, 37 to remove any doubts that the disciples asked Jesus where these folks would be taken. They will be taken where the dead carcasses are normally carried off and consumed by the vultures. These verses presupposes there will be survivors of this destruction who will be left on the land after the destruction. If it was talking about the end of the universe, there would be no survivors. So it must be speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. In regard to the rapture, preterists have shown that the language used here in Matthew 23, 25 has at least 15 similarities with 1 Thessalonians 4, 5. The most important of these similarities is with Matthew 24, 29 to 31, which refers to the gathering of the living saints by the angels. This gathering or rapture occurred in AD 66, right before the Jewish war. Few doubt the connection between 23 and 24, but the unity between chapter 24 and 25 has been questioned. Matthew 25, 1 to 13 is a parable about 10 virgins. This is focused on the return of the bridegroom, Christ, in Matthew 25, 13 to 30, Jesus presents another parable about the talents. This is also connected with the return of the master. Finally, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Jesus talks about when the Son of Man comes. How can anyone believe that the coming of the Son of Man there is mentioned in all three sections of Matthew 25 are speaking of different coming? than the one mentioned in Matthew 24. If there were no coming statements in Matthew 25, we might be justified in doubting the unity of the three chapters. But all three chapters speak of the same, coming of the Son of Man, without distinguishing between them. Neither Jesus nor the New Testament writers ever distinguish between two different returns of Christ, separated 2,000 years. The lack of any distinction generally in the New Testament and specifically here in Matthew 23-25, demands that these three chapters are a unity and are speaking of the same return of Christ in 70 AD. It might also be helpful to note, whilst we are discussing the timing of the one and only parousia coming of Christ in the first century, that the word parousia was a technical term used by the Greeks to refer to the visitation of a king to one of his subject territories. It was an extended visitation, in some cases lasting for more than a year, in order to reward his faithful subjects 
and punish his rebellious subjects. That appears to be the idea that is in mind here with the parousia of Christ. It was not just one day or twinkling of an eye event. It was an extended visitation to reward his faithful disciples and pour out his wrath upon the rebellious Jews, which evidently began in AD 66 and extended at least until Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD.